everybody. I'm Catherine Kosliki. I'm professor of theoretical philosophy at the University of Neuchatel. And I've been asked to make a video about artifacts for the Social Ontology Research Group video series. Now, there's lots of interesting questions about artifacts. For example, we might wonder if artifacts are real or as real as natural things, are artifacts substances? And if so, in what sense of substance? Are artifacts mind dependent? And if so, in what way? And are artifacts social entities? Now, my plan in this video is gonna be the following. I will briefly talk about an attempt to give a definition of what it is to be an artifact, some tricky cases that arise with respect to this definition, some existing accounts of artifacts, challenges for existing accounts. I will briefly sketch an alternative approach that I favor, and I will leave you with a series of open questions and challenging phenomena that I think deserve to be addressed more. So let's get started. In his 2011 entry on artifacts in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Risto Hilpinen gave the following definition of what it is to be an artifact. He says, an artifact may be defined as an object that has been intentionally made or produced for a certain purpose. Now, you, we have three important components of this definition here. There's the idea of being intentionally versus non-intentionally produced or made. Secondly, the idea that there is a process of making or production and then thirdly, the idea that this process aims towards a certain purpose or goal. Now, as soon as we start to think about this very intuitively sounding definition a bit more, we realize that there are lots of tricky cases. For example, cases like domesticated dogs or seedless grapes, where it seems like we have members of previously accepted natural kinds, for example, biological kinds, but these things are do meet the definition, that is, they are intentionally produced for a certain purpose. Secondly, there are cases like Marcel Duchamp's sculpture called Fountain, or found objects, for example, a piece of driftwood that has washed up on a beach and can be used as a coffee table or a bench without requiring any intrinsic modification, that puts pressure on the idea of whether there really needs to be a process of production or making that requires intrinsic changes on the part of the previously existing ingredients. Thirdly, there are cases like uh, heaps of sawdust, things that are byproducts, residue, or unintended outcomes of intentional activity. Fourthly, there are cases like bird's nests, spider webs, beaver dams, and so on, where we seem to have activity that is directed towards a certain goal or purpose, but the agent in question is not a human agent, and so we have to figure out how cognitively sophisticated the agent in question has to be in order to count as having produced an artifact. And finally, the case of artworks like the Mona Lisa, where it's at least not as straightforward to figure out what the goal or purpose might be of the intentional creative activity in question. So these are all cases that in some way or other put pressure on the various components of Risto Hilpinen's definition. Now, if we look at existing accounts of artifacts, 
we find that they can be grouped broadly into two categories. There is author intention-based accounts of artifacts, which take it that an artifact is either directly or indirectly what its original author intended it to be. And here the term author is used very broadly to include designers, producers, builders, and so forth, whoever is responsible for the creation of an artifact. And then on the other hand, there is a user-based account according to which an artifact's use or history of reproduction determines what it is. Now, here are some examples of existing accounts, starting with Amy Thomas's account that is based on maker intentions, Simon Evnine's account that is also an author intention-based account uh, centered around the intentions guiding the creative act that results in the production of an artifact. Several different accounts centering on the notion of function, for example, Lynn Rutterbaker's account, which is also of the author intention-based variety, takes the proper function of an object, of an artifact, to be what its original author intended it to be. And then we have Beth Preston's user-based account defended in her book, A Philosophy of Material Culture. In the last chapter of my 2018 book, Form Matter Substance, I discuss a whole series of challenges for author intention-based accounts. I don't have time to go into all of these right now, but if you're interested in following up more, I encourage you to check out the last chapter of my book. In the current context, I'll just present you with one type of case that I think is tricky for author intention-based accounts. So let's talk about the telephone and let's suppose for present purposes that the original author intentions of Alexander Graham Bell when he invented this device was to create something that could be used to amplify sound in order to aid the hearing impaired. And there seems to be some historical justification for thinking that that's in fact what happened. But as we all know, the actual use of this device, the telephone, is to enable long distance communication, whether you're hearing impair impaired or not. So in this case, I think author intention-based accounts simply yield the wrong result. They tell us to classify the telephone, the device that Alexander Graham Bell invented as a type of hearing aid instead of as a type of long distance communication device. User-based accounts like Beth Preston's account, on the other hand, I think face challenges when it comes to the possibility of malfunctioning prototypes. So for example, let's consider a case where an agent has come up with a novel strategy to open cans and sets out to produce the first ever can opener prototype. But something goes wrong during the process of prototype production and the resulting thing does not actually successfully implement the agent's strategy. So in that case, since there's no history of use or reproduction, and we can't refer back to the author intention since we're dealing with a user-based account, it becomes very difficult to actually classify the resulting outcome as either a malfunctioning can opener prototype or any other type of artifact for that matter, since there's no history of use or reproduction. So it seems like we're left with a type of object that cannot be assigned to any artifact kind. I take that to be an unfortunate result. So these sorts of cases suggest to me that there, in at least some scenarios, neither author intention-based accounts nor user-based accounts yield the right result. And so instead, I favor what I 
take to be a more object-centered approach, that is an account which puts greater emphasis on the object itself and its capacities, but to allow for cases of malfunction, these capacities can't just be the actual capacities, but they need to include the potential capacities of the object, that is, the capacities that it could manifest if it was repaired or otherwise modified in a way that is compatible with its kind membership. For this type of account, because an object, of course, has all sorts of potential capacities, it's very important that we make a distinction between the object's function on the one hand versus its accidental uses or by the byproducts of the traits that it has. But this kind of distinction is, of course, familiar to us from discussions of biological function. So, for example, the function of the polar bear's coat, let's say, is to protect it from its harsh environment. As a byproduct, the polar bear's coat is also heavy, but the heaviness of the polar bear's coat is not its function. Similarly, human noses are also really good resting places for glasses, but it's not the function of the human nose to act as a resting place for glasses. So there's lots of motivation anyway to want to distinguish the function of a trait from its accidental uses or the byproducts of the presence of the trait. Assuming that we can make this distinction work, I think this type of account does better in cases like amulets, evil eyes, voodoo dolls, or perpetual motion machines, where the classification of an artifact seems to diverge from what either the author intentions or the user practices would predict. For example, take an amulet that was originally intended to be used to dispel evil spirits, and perhaps it's actually used with the intention of dispelling evil spirits. But of course, it's unsuccessful either because there are no evil spirits or because even if there are evil spirits, they can't be dispelled by using this device. And so in fact, it should be classified as something like a piece of jewelry, uh, contrary to what author intention-based or user-based practices would predict. And similarly in the other cases. Okay, so now um, I've briefly presented to you how we might intuitively try to define what it is to be an artifact, some challenging cases, existing accounts, difficulties with these existing accounts, and an alternative account that I favor. So I'm going to leave you with a few open questions and challenging phenomena. So there's a whole series of interesting questions surrounding the reality, mind dependence, and substance status of artifacts. A sub-series of questions is to figure out the role of agent intentions and user practices in an account of artifacts. There is questions about the classification of artifacts. So where do artifact kinds belong with respect to the division between, for example, social kinds and natural kinds? There are all the tricky cases, some of which I've presented to you earlier in this video that raise very difficult questions for classification. Should an account of artifact be essentialist? Are there such things as artifact essences? If so, can we give a real definition of what it is to be an artifact or is a more plausible direction to go anti-essentialist, in which case, what sort of shape should an anti-essentialist account of artifacts take? Very prominent in the literature on artifacts is the idea that at least in certain central cases, artifacts have functions, which also opens up the possibility of the phenomenon of malfunction so there is some kind of normativity uh, 
that allows us to say, for example, of a knife, that it is a good knife, that it does what a knife is supposed to do. And this kind of normativity, of course, needs to be accounted for. The phenomenon of prototype production is very interesting because it presents us with cases where if the attempt is successful, an agent manages to create not just a single object, but actually a whole novel kind of object. So we need some systematic account for the criteria for success and failure for prototype production. And finally, there is the phenomenon of disassembly in the case of artifacts. So we can take an artifact apart, we can put it back together, and that raises the question of whether the same thing uh, continues to exist but intermittently, or whether the initial artifact ceases to exist and a new artifact that's very similar comes into existence after assembly. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully I've uh, managed to convince you that there are lots of interesting questions to pursue in the realm of artifacts. And thank you for watching.